Welcome back guys to another video. Thank you guys for joining. This is by far going to be my favorite video to make due to the fact of the information that's going to be given. This is truly going to be the best video to watch when it comes to wholesaling real estate because there's information here that no one else is going to give you. Now, these are mistakes that I've made and I've learned the hard way, whether it's wasting time, wasting money, and I'm going to save you guys that trouble by putting everything out there when it comes to wholesaling real estate. So let's start. First thing we're going to be talking about is lead generation. This is your number one thing. You're going to have to create leads. You're going to have to find those motivated sellers. You're going to have to find those distressed properties. Now, there are three ways that we do this. And the number one way that everyone is going to tell you is softwares, right? You hear about PropStream, you hear about Batch Leads. Let's talk about PropStream and Batch Leads. Now, PropStream and Batch Leads are great tools to use when it comes to creating lists. The only issue that I truly have with PropStream and Batch Lead is the fact that it's so saturated, right? One of the first things that wholesalers do when they you know, become a wholesaler is download PropStream, download Batch Leads, and they start pulling a list. Now, it becomes a very highly saturated thing when you're all fighting for the same location, fighting for the same area. Um, again, these are when filters come into play to try to better yourself and try to find those really niche lists that, that, that not everyone is going for, right? Now, let me talk about PropStream and Batch Leads. So PropStream costs about $99 a month. It offers you the exact same thing as Batch Leads that also costs $99 a month for their basic plan. Now PropStream does have an advantage. It does offer a driving for dollars app when you pay $99 a month. So when you're driving around, you get a map, interactive map, press on it, and it adds it to your list. Kind of cool, right? So rather than you know pen and paper writing down the address, you just press it and it adds it to your list. You can skip trace it right through the site. So it's kind of like the Deal Machine app, just a little not as great to say the least. But you know, for ninety nine dollars, if I'm paying for it anyway and I'm getting a free platform, you know, under it, go ahead, I'll I'll take it. Now Batch Leads is a little bit different. They don't really offer anything when you pay that ninety nine dollars a month, but they do have a lot of add ons, right? So they offer a SMS platform, they offer a dialer as well, but you do have to pay a little bit more in order to get those into your system. Now, Batchly is kind of what is going for that whole fully interactive, all-in-one kind of platform. You get the lead, you get the texting, you get the dialer, um, and dialer is when you're calling. It calls, I believe, three or five people at once, uh, which is pretty cool. So if, if that's the case that you want to go with, Batchly is probably is the one for you, um, but honestly, they both do the same exact thing. So either or that you go with, you're gonna get similar data, you're gonna get um, very interactive, very easy to use softwares. Um, there's there's not really much I can say about these software. There is the Flipster software that, that I talked about a couple of times. Um, now I do like the Flipster software. The only issue that I have is that it does not have as much leads compared to PropStream and Batch Leads. I believe in the whole entire state of New Jersey, it gave me about 35, 40,000 leads. Uh, compared to PropStream Batch Leads, they're in the millions, right? Now, I did do my own little interactive test when it came to PropStream and Batch Leads. I went and took the exact same street and in a specific town on both of these lists and inputted it and saw how many actual properties that came up. Now, PropStream gave me about 107 properties. Batch Leads gave me over 123 properties. So, Batch Leads did give me more properties. Now, it might just be the street, but who knows? I think they both kind of do the same thing. It really depends on which one you like. Um, and one of the best ways to figure that out is to utilize the free trials. Now, I talk about this all the time. Free trials, free trials, free trials. When you're first starting out, utilize them. They're free. They're easy to use. Go for it. PropStream offers seven-day free trial on the entire platform. And then Batchley's is giving you 5,000 free property records. That is 5,000 vacant homes, 5,000 high equity houses, 5,000 tax delinquent, whatever list you want to go for, they're giving it to you for free. Yes, you have to skip trace it and call them yourself, but they're giving you 5,000 free property records. And then of course, PropStream is giving you seven days free trials. You can pull up comps, you can pull up filters, you can pull up leads, just get accustomed to the actual software, get used to what we're supposed to be looking at. So utilize them, especially when you're first starting out, please do They're free, use them as much as possible. So that's what I have to say about the softwares. So the next one we're going to is public county records, right? I talk about public county records all the time um, just because it's free, it's straight to the source. Um, they are a little, a little mumble jumble 
to say the least they don't give it to you in the best fashion sometimes they give it to you handwritten so you have to go plug in all that information into an excel and then skip trace it but you know what for free information we're going to put in that extra work so public county records what are we asking for right i'm asking for these three things tax delinquent code violations and vacant right now tax delinquent properties i asked for a list of properties that are delinquent on their utilities and or taxes Please provide the full address name as well as the balance. Oh, yes, you have to literally ask them for the name and address or sometimes they won't give it to you. Um, so this is very important because in order to skip trace it, I need the address, I need the name. Now the balance, why do I ask for the balance? This is a good question. So as you guys know, during COVID, a lot of people did not pay off things that they should be paying. Um, so taxes were one big thing, utilities were another big thing. Um, so for me, I'd rather focus on the homeowners that owe 10,000, 15,000, 13,000, whatever the number is, I just need to see a big number. And that way I know they're motivated. That way I know they're in the red zone. They're, they're going to get an extra special call. They're going to get double calls, triple calls compared to people that owe a hundred dollars or they just missed the payment and they owe like $25 on a water bill, right? I, you know, I'm going to call them anyway, just, you know, they might be at the start of, you know, becoming that motivated seller but I'm going to kind of prioritize and focus on those that owe a substantial amount. That's why I asked for the balance owed. That's for tax delinquent. Now for code violations, it's a little bit different. One of the biggest things is what's code violations. So I know here in New Jersey, code violations can be just about anything, right? So overgrown grass is a code violation. Well, another code violation is uh, roaches, bed bugs, mice. These are all code violations. Cracks on the sidewalk, code violation. Um, didn't shovel their snow is a code violation. Now, every city, every county, everything has a little different when it comes to prioritizing these code violations. But here in Jersey, they're very accurate with it, depending on the city. So rather for me than driving around and looking for overgrown grass, I can get a list of code violations of overgrown grass and call them up. You know, overgrown grass is a great example of what might be a vacant property, what may be a senior living in the property that can't mow the lawn. Um, but these are really good lists to kind of go after. Now, the same thing with tax delinquent. I asked them for a list of properties with code violations on them for the last six months. Please include the full address and the name in order for me to skip trace it, get the phone numbers and give them a call. Now, the next one and my favorite, favorite list is vacant and abandoned homes because they are the easiest. Owners of vacant properties are usually the most motivated because of the fact that the house is literally just sitting there wasting money. Um, and again, they're easy to show, they're easy to get into, so they're one of the best lists to go for. The only issue is that it's very highly competitive. Everyone is going for those vacant properties because of that easiness, because they're motivated. Um, but with public county records, we're asking them for a list of properties flagged abandoned or vacant. Now, here's the thing. In Jersey, I'm not sure about every other state, but in Jersey, if you have a vacant property, by law, you have to register it with the city. Now, this is great for us because we're getting information from the source. We're getting properties that are listed vacant and they should be vacant. You know, it's not always accurate, of course. You know, they don't update their records as, as much as they should, but it's as close as perfect as we're going to get compared to softwares that are kind of just pulling information that might not be correct. And the next one is going to be driving for dollars. I talk about driving for dollars because of the fact that I got my first deal that way, you know? So I know a lot of people talk a little bit like it's a not the greatest, you know, driving around, wasting gas money and all this. But honestly, I got my first deal that way. I got my third deal that way. Driving around, looking for ugly houses, um, writing down the address, calling the homeowner up, locking it up on their contract. It might sound so simple, and it is It is that simple. It is that easy. Um, but there is a lot that goes into play with this. But let's talk about driving for dollars, right? One of the first things you're going to do is pick a specific neighborhood. For me, I like choosing my own backyard. I like choosing a place where I'm comfortable, where I know where are the best houses, where are the worst houses, where everyone is going to, where the houses are selling the most. And if you guys don't know this stuff, this is what you should be first researching. Research your own backyard. Find out what's working. Now the next step is to drive around if you can't drive around i know a lot of people do it virtually with google maps like the street view and they kind of drive around through street view the only issue that i have with that is google street view isn't as accurate you know it's not updated every single month so you might be looking at a property a year ago that was run down but someone must have you know someone bought it fixed it up and you wouldn't know that you know unless you're driving around in front of the house 
Um, but it works. I know a lot of people that still do it. If you look at the date, just be careful. You know, sometimes the list isn't updated for two, three years. Uh, but if you can't drive around, Google Street View is a great way to start. But so for driving around, what are we looking for, right? We're looking for boarded up windows, boarded up doors. We're looking for overgrown grass. We're looking for junkyard in the back. We're looking for what are signs of a distressed property, signs that somebody might not be living in there, signs that whoever is living in there does not care about the house anymore. This is what we're looking for, same as step three. All right, so now we're going to step four. We are going to be writing down the address and taking down pictures. Now, here's a little tip for you guys. You guys know about PropStream. It offers a driving for dollars app. You guys know about Deal Machine. It's a fully interactive deal driving for dollars app, right? That's what it does. It's like $49 a month. Um, but here's a free tip for you guys. The Parcel app, right? I'm going to add it right here. It's absolutely free to use. When you're driving for, for dollars, when you're driving around, it's going to drive with you, right? It, it tracks your location. When you find a property run down, you're going to zoom in press on that house and save it. It's going to give you the homeowner's name, right? It saves you that extra step of finding the homeowner's name, right? It's really cool. It gives you some basic information about the property and it's absolutely free, right? And you can save it rather than pen and paper. You know, it's a, it's a great way to start, right? We're, we're starting, we're, we're going beginner friendly. We're going as cheap as possible. We're gonna put more money in our pockets, um, but that's what we're doing for step four. Let's see, step five. We're going to skip trace and market our list. We're going to be talking about this in a later slide about skip tracing and how to market it, but that's what we're doing, right? You got this list, you're going to get the phone numbers, and then you're going to call them up. You're going to text them. You're going to call them. Um, you know, some people can also door knock. If that's something that you're comfortable in doing, go ahead and door knock on the door. Another thing is writing notes and just slipping it under the door or just leaving it on the side. One thing that I also learned very recently is you cannot touch their mailbox. It is illegal to touch their mailbox. So do not put a letter in the mailbox, just slide it under the door, put it on the side of a door, wherever you need to, just don't, don't touch the mailbox. You know, you're not a mailman, you're not a mailwoman. That's the law, I guess. I didn't know that, you know, I, I'm not gonna commit to a crime online, but let's just say we had our fair share of, of situations. Next step is step six. We're making offers and we're closing the. All right, so now we have skip tracing to talk about. Uh, so all we have is a list of properties, a bunch of names. We need to get those phone numbers. We need to get that contact information in order to call them, to text them and ask them, are you interested in selling your property? Um, so this is a little case study that I did. I did make a full video about this. So if you guys want more information, watch that video because I'm going to kind of zoom through this. Um, but watch that video if you want a little bit more in depth. Um, so I did a little case study. I tested out kind of the biggest names that I hear when it comes to skip tracing, prop stream, batch leads, lead Sherpa, skip matrix, Fiverr, skip Butler and smarter contact. The price of each service is right there. Again, I think if you have an account with prop stream and batch leads, the price does get lower. Um, but 12 cents and 20 cents is what they offer if you don't have an account with them. Um, what's another one? Skip Butler, you pay $50 a month. But those are kind of the only things when it comes to price, right? Everything else is accurate so far from the time that I made this video. Uh, so the total cost comes right there. It's 200 leads. Prop stream at 12 cents comes at $24. 20 cents at 200 leads comes at $40. You guys can do the rest of the math. Um, so those 200 leads are the same, I guess, criteria list. They were all vacant properties in the same town. I couldn't do the same 200 leads on all of them because when I come to contact them, I'm going to be sending the same person seven messages, which wouldn't be fair because they might answer me the first time and they won't answer me the second, third, fourth, fifth time. So they're different leads, but they follow, you know, I got them all from one source. I got them all for one specific criteria. So it's as, as close, as perfect as we're gonna get. So that was the cost. The next one is the hit rate. So out of 200 leads, how many they actually found for me, you guys can see below. Uh, if you guys want in depth again, watch the video and then reply. So I sent out a text blast of, for all of the leads, um, that row tells you how many people replied. Keep in mind, this can be no, it can be go away. It can be stop texting me. It can be F off, whatever reply, but they did reply. There was somebody behind that screen, right? That's all I needed to know that someone was actually behind that screen. Um, and then again, wrong number. How many people said this number is not mine again, they might be lying, but this is what we're gonna you know we're trying to be as accurate as possible right this is the information that we got so when it comes to it 
skip matrix seems to be the best you know we got the best hit rate the best replies um and you know one of the lowest wrong number rates but the issue with skip matrix is that it took me three days to get my list uh which wasn't the the greatest compared to prop stream batch leads lead chirpa smarter contact that give it to you almost instantly even skip butler so the only other one that also doesn't give it to you instantly is fiverr um but honestly for the price it doesn't sound like a bad deal you know Batch leads cost us $40 for those 200 leads. Fiverr cost us about $8 and we had more wrong numbers at batch leads. So it really depends on you. You guys have all this information in front of you. It's up to you on which ones you prefer to use. Um, but I guess in, in ranking mode, uh, skip matrix comes as number one, but you do have to wait three to four days for it. Prop stream came as number two, which isn't bad at all. Um, I guess you guys can pick your next third, fourth, fifth winner. For me, Fiverr, for, for that price, especially when you're first starting out, it's not bad. It's not bad at all. Um, but keep in mind, it does take 24 to 48 hours to get your list skip trace. All right, let's go to the next one. Contacting leads. Now where the fun begins, we have to text them. We have to call them. We have to reach them. All right, so let's start with how to pre-qualify a motivated homeowner. We're looking for four things. These are four very important things. The same thing I tell my virtual assistants, the same things I tell my interns, is that you need to figure out these four things before you send it to me, right? If you don't have this information, you, you have nothing, right? You gotta figure out these four things in order to qualify them, in order for us to go to the next step with them. And now number one is the condition. One of the biggest things you're gonna get when you call up a homeowner and say, hey, are you interested in selling? They're gonna be like, what's your offer, right? Now, the first thing that I like to do is I would love to give you an offer, but first things first, I need to know the general condition of the property. I need to know if you've made any improvements in the last three to five years. I need to know if there's any major repairs that need to be done on this property. That's the first thing. I need to know the condition of the house. The second thing is their motivation. Why are you selling it? And, you know, I kind of go about it in a very sweet, simple way. Like this this sounds like an amazing property this sounds like something that we're interested in i just want to know why are you why are you looking to sell it and this is kind of where they start talking about themselves they start talking about whether it's financial distress talking about a divorce talking about it's been inherited talking about their actual situation and this is where you would know how to play amongst those feelings right if it's an inheritance you know that their parents someone close to them just passed away right and you know how to be a little bit more compassionate on the situation this is their parents property um, another one is financial distress. You know that they are in some sort of situation where they are in need of money fast. Now, this is where you come into play of, I can close in two weeks, right? I can close in 30 days. Um, so it really depends. Motivation kind of gives you a little bit of an advantage on how to you know, give them something that they really want, whether it's more money, whether it's faster closing, whether it's maybe covering some moving expenses, whatever the case may be. All right, let's go to the third one, timeline. This is a big one. How soon are you looking to sell? This is great because a lot of the times, especially during that March, April time, people will tell you after the school year, during the summer. Um, so that way you know to follow up at the summertime. You know, obviously you're gonna follow up before then as well, but you know that during the summer is where their mindset is going to be at, I'm going to be relocating. I'm going to be moving. This is where I'm gonna be calling them at least two, three times a week. Um, so we gotta figure out how soon they're looking to sell it because if they say ASAP, now we need to know, oh, we can close in two weeks. We can close in a month. If they're telling you, oh, I'm not really in a rush, know that you telling them to close in two weeks is going to put them in kind of a constraint. Like, oh my God, I got to get out of here in two weeks. So ask them their timeline. Ask how soon they're looking to sell. And the last one, the biggest one is their price. How much do you want for the property? Knowing that we cover all the expenses, we cover the closing costs, there's no realtor commissions. How much are you looking to walk away with? And this is the kind of question that should tell you if this is a potential great property. This is something that we need to renegotiate. This is a property where it's not going to work. You know, we're too far apart. I mean, I'm still going to give you my offer, but you might just laugh me off, which is fine. You know, it happens, but I'm going to give you an offer regardless of the situation. You can tell me 800000 I have no shame in telling you $300,000 for that property. But again, you need to know their price and sometimes they won't give it to you, which is fine. We try to ask them questions in order to get it, but some of them are just very adamant on not giving you that first number. And that's where we kind of lowball, right? And sometimes they just wanna hear that that first number, right? So if they won't give me a price, I'll be like, okay, what if I give you $200,000 today? 
and they're like no my house is worth over five hundred thousand. okay you just gave me your number is that how much you're looking to walk away with is that your your end number right there and they're like yeah i guess 500 550 is what i'm aiming for and that's kind of where i have to put into play does this make sense for me does this something that i should continue talking about um but price four things you need to get is condition motivation timeline price once you have these things you can make an offer you can lead the conversation and you can have some sort of advantage because you have all this information in front of you let's go to the next one your texting script your texting 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 now a lot of the time people say you know what's the best one should i text should i call they both do the same thing but there is pros and cons for both and we'll talk about it all right so for texting we're having the best response rate, right? Everyone's looking at their text messages. Everyone sees when a message comes up compared to phone calls. Not a lot of people answer unknown numbers. I know me personally, if I see a text, I'm going to look at it. I might not respond to you, but I'm gonna look at it. If you call me unknown number, I'm not answering. Um, maybe leave a voicemail, but even then I'm not gonna call you back. Um, I'm gonna want you to call me back, right? That's when follow-up comes into play. So texting script, this is the one that I have. I'm gonna make a video kind of going into depth with, with what all this means, but I like following up and you guys can see by day one, day three, day seven on how I text homeowners. You guys can read it. I'm gonna link this presentation below in the description. So you guys are gonna have all of this in front of you, but this is my texting script that I use. Um, let's go to the next one. As you guys can see, I don't stop after the third message. I'm continuing on the 14th day, the 30th day, now you might ask, why do I text them so much? And here's the thing. I know me personally, if you send me a text message at the wrong time, I might look at it, I might be interested, but you just caught me at a really bad time, right? I might've been busy, I looked at it, uh, you know, life came along and I completely forgot about the message. And then, you know, when you send me the second one, I'm just like, oh yeah, I was supposed to respond to this. And some people, it might not be the second message, it might be the third message where they get their aha moment, right? So follow up, this is usually for, for people that don't respond at all, right? If someone responds, no, go away, they're, they're put to the do not call list. Um, and if they are responding, no, not interested or whatever the case may be, they're put into a whole different, you know, automation when it comes to text. Uh, but this is kind of what I focus on day 14, day 30, and then day 120 is somewhat my last one for, for a while. And then they get kind of a text like at the end of the year type of thing. Um, but this is how I focus it on. I try to follow up as much as possible because following up is your best friend. Now, the next thing we're going to be talking about is calling, right? So a lot of people don't like calling. Unfortunately, as a part of the game, you got to call. Now, I love texting. I love text blasting. But the thing is, you are not building that rapport hiding behind a screen. You're waiting sometimes hours for a response compared to being on the phone and getting it within minutes, hearing what their issue is, listening to them, realizing that you're a real person on the phone helps you tremendously when it comes to building that rapport with the homeowner. But again, this is my cold calling script. It's going to be linked in the description as well. This is the one that I use to train my virtual assistants. It's the one that I use for myself. And it follows kind of the same structure as that four, um, four ways to pre-qualify a motivated seller. As you guys can see, one of the first things I say is, hey, this is Swad with Direct Buyers Nationwide. If you don't have an LLC, you can always say I'm a local investor in the area. You don't have to have an LLC when you're first starting wholesaling. Um, but if you want to, you absolutely can um, and then I go straight to the point, right? I was calling you about a property on 123 Main Street. One of the worst things that you can, well, I mean, it might not be the worst things, but for me, I know personally, if you're calling me, come, come straight to the point, right? Tell me what it is you want. Don't ask me how, I'm, how I am. Don't ask me about the weather. Don't try to build a conversation. You are a stranger on the phone. What do you want before I hang up? So that's why for me, hi, introduce myself. I'm interested in your property. Are you looking to sell? Straight to the point, just like that. So again, I have a, a breakdown. If they say yes, I move into collecting information. If they say no, I say, do you have any other properties you might be interested in selling? Now this has worked before. That's why I have it there for my virtual assistants because I know it works. It might not work all the time, but some homeowners, some people have more than one properties. And when you don't ask them, they're not gonna tell you, right? It's like, you're asking them about the property they primarily live in, right? Let's just say you asking them about one, two, three main street. They live in that property, that's their home. They're, you know, are you interested in selling that? No, okay, thank you. But you don't realize that they own four other properties. They might own another property that is just sitting there, you know, the collecting dust. Um, so just ask, you have nothing to lose. Um, and then again, if they say no, that's, that's fine. Thank you again for your time. Move on to the next person.
you know, we'll follow up with them in a couple of weeks. Uh, so the next thing I asked is, same as that, that list of four ways to pre-qualify a motivated seller, the first thing I'm asking is the general condition of the property. Now let's go to the next one, property checklist, right? That's what we're going over. This is the questions that I'm asking. If it's a rental, what is it currently rented for? Is the property listed with a realtor? You guys have this all in front of you guys. Use it. All right, next one I'm going for is motivation. Why are you selling, right? These are common motivations that they might tell you. The next one, timeline. When do you want to sell? And then of course, at the last part, you see how much do you want for your property? Here's the thing that, that that's a little tip that I'm gonna share with you guys. At the end, I say, you know this sounds like a property we will likely want to make an offer on. I'm going to take everything you told me to my manager. We will evaluate it and call you back. When would be a good time to reach out? Right? Why do I say there's a manager in play? Why do I put someone above me? And here's the reason why. When you're calling back to make an offer, it's kind of the scariest part of all this, right? If they say yes, you just locked up a deal. If they say no, now you have to renegotiate. Now you have to maybe do something else for them, whatever the case may be in order to close this deal. Now, for me, I like putting the blame on someone else, right? I might be, you know, in charge, I may be the manager, whatever, but I'm going to put the blame on somebody else and make it seem like I'm on their side, right? So one of the things that calls like, hey, you know, I spoke to my manager, he said we can offer $300,000 cash as is, cover your closing costs, and they're like, wait, no, that's too low. And then I'm just like, um, so what number would make sense? He's like, I'd probably go with 375. And I'm just like, you know what? Let me try and see what I can do with my manager. I'm gonna ask him, I know he's, He's very headstrong about an offer. He said the, the highest we can go is 300. I don't know why. You know, let me see what I can do. Let me contact him. Let me see what I can do for you. Let me try and get you as close as possible to that 375. And that's when I call him back in a couple of hours. And I'm just like, you know what? I spoke to him. Like, yeah, I'm really tooth and nail with this. But he's telling me 325 is the highest he'd ever go. Um, you know, I'm really working on this with you. It's like this, this is their maximum budget for it. Um, does that look like something that you could be able to... to to come closer to and you know that's where more renegotiating comes into place or sometimes they just agree to that price but i always like to blame somebody else have you know some some sort of staying on their side staying on their good side um when this entire you know throughout this entire conversation um and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but you know it's a little tip that that would help you you know rather than you getting yelled at you know yell at them yell with them about somebody else right all right, so the next step is making an offer. This is sometimes a tricky part. We gotta use a little math into this, but it's all right. So we're gonna go with the traditional 70% rule, right? ARV times 70% minus the rehab minus the assignment fee equals our offer, right? So ARV, what does it mean? It's the after repair value. When the house is all fixed up, how much is it going to sell for? That is your number that you need to find out, whether you're using PropStream, whether you're using Batch Leads, whether you're using Zillow, free estimates, you are going to find the ARV. You're going to go, if you're doing Zillow the freeway, you're going to look for properties that have the same bedroom, bathroom, that are in the same somewhat area, you know, half a mile, a mile away, that have the same square footage, that look kind of the same, and you're going to see how much they sold for when they were all fixed up and put on the open market. That is your after repair value. You're going to get about three or four of them, find the average, and that's your, your magic number, your ARV. Then you're going to multiply it by 70%. Now what's left is that 30% and that is how much an investor wants to make. They're, the investor has closing costs, they have realtor commissions, and they also want to make a profit. So 30% is usually that magic number of covering all their expenses plus making a hefty profit. Um, you know, in this market, we've seen it go up to 75 to 80% um, with the ARV. But now with the market kind of cooling down, we're trying to stay a little bit more on that 70% rule. Um, but that's kind of the, the biggest hint that I can give you guys. Try to stay with 70%. I know you guys want to go over with 80. I've seen people go up to 90, but you're giving them market value. Um, it's a lot harder to find a buyer when you're going up to those types of numbers. Next thing is we're going to subtract the rehab. We're going to talk about rehab on the next slide. And then we're going to subtract our assignment fee. Assignment fees typically range between ten dollars to $30,000, depending on the deal. So up to you guys on how much you want to make. So let me show you guys a real example that we're working on. So the ARV of this property is $599,000 at times the 70% rule makes it at $419,000. Now we're going to subtract the rehab. The rehab came about $40,000. And then we're gonna subtract our assignment fee, which is $30,000. So our offer 
our maximum offer is $350,000. Now, of course, if we want to subtract a little bit from our assignment fee, we can offer a little bit more. But that's up to you guys if you want, you're willing to do that or if you really want to negotiate as much as possible to keep more money in your pocket. So first thing I'm going to do is offer them less than that maximum offer. And here's why. When you give a homeowner that first number, keep in mind there's going to be renegotiation. There's going to be back and forth. If your maximum offer is 350, why would you tell them 350 as your first number? Knowing they're going to ask 375 or 400 and you can't go back to that 350. You have to move closer to their number. Another thing, when a homeowner gives you a number, let's say I was speaking to the homeowner and they said, yeah, I'm looking for about 350. This is great and all. And I would love to say, hey, yes, I'll give you 350 because I know this is the number that I'm aiming for. But subconsciously, with our mindset, when you give someone what they want, they always think that they're being played, that they're being ripped off, right? It, the fact that you cave too soon, that you said yes, is just mind boggling to them. And I've had it happen to me multiple times. You always have to try and negotiate. People love to negotiate. People need to feel like they they won, right? So one of the biggest things is not to give them what they want, unfortunately. Try to come close, right? If they are asking for 350, I'd probably start at 330, right? Come to 340 at the end, you know, meet in the middle. Unless they're like dead on, like I want 350, I want 350. Then at that point, I'm just like, you know what? You drive a hard bargain. I'm going to give you what you want. I'll offer you that 350. Uh, you know, so it really depends on the situation. It depends on the homeowner, but try to negotiate, try to have that wiggle room in order to come close to that number. Um, and you see the 70% rule, it does work because we did stay close to that number. We actually are locking it up pretty soon on this one. Um, but use a 70% rule. If you need to go higher, try to 75, try not to go past 80%. You, you're going to have a hard time finding a buyer. Um, it really just depends on the property. Uh, but don't forget to subtract the rehab and don't forget to subtract your fee, right? So the next one is calculating rehab. I did have a chart a while back on a different presentation, uh, but again, things got expensive throughout the years. So this is the new chart. It's going to be, it's not accurate. Again, here's the thing. We're not contractors. We're not fixers. We're not investors. This is just an estimate to help our investors out, right? And to help us make the best offer possible. We are not we don't know how much a roof costs to change. We don't know how much a septic tank. We don't know how much oil tank tastes. I mean, eventually you're going to start to, to learn this stuff, but you know, this is not our, our, not our priority, right? Our priority is locking up a property. And so this is what we use to kind of get as close to an estimate as possible in order to give the investor as, as much information as possible. So here's the thing, light rehab, medium rehab, heavy rehab, full gut. And then on the top row is the square footage. So the size of the property and you guys can coordinate the prices that come into play. So these are our numbers, you know, as you guys can see, light rehab, less than 1,500 square feet, we're looking at about 20,000. You know, for a full gut, we're looking at almost $80,000. Um, let's look at 3,000 square feet for a light rehab on a big house, we're looking at 40,000 plus. And you know, light rehab is just paint, maybe change the flooring, paint the siding, maybe some landscaping here and there. And then for full guts, we're looking at a full gut. We're talking about ripping the walls out, you know, but, these are estimates, but they do help it for, for us to make our offer and for our investors to know an estimate of how much they're looking at. And usually investors will bring their own contractors or they'll have enough experience to know how much it's going to cost them. All right, next one is going to be virtual assistants, right? In wholesaling real estate, you don't want to keep making calls. You don't want to keep making texts. You want this automated. You want someone else doing this stuff for you, especially the heavy, you know, the heavy workload that you don't want. You don't want to be on the phone for 40 hours. That's where virtual assistants come into play. So with virtual assistants, I usually use them for cold calling. I do have a few that kind of organize lists for me, um, especially public county records. They come in very bad format. Sometimes they're in you know Word documents. Sometimes they're like handwritten and I need to put them in Excel sheets. So I have virtual assistants that do that. Um, but a big portion of virtual assistants focus on calling, right? Now here's what I, what I post, right? All right, let's talk about where I post, right? So there's four ways to get virtual assistants. The number one way is going to be upwork.com. The second one is Facebook groups. Third one is LinkedIn. And the fourth one is Fiverr. Um, and you, this is kind of what I post on Upwork. And I get most of my virtual assistants on Upwork. Sometimes on Facebook, if they comment on something, I'll like get on a Zoom call with them and see if they can help me out with something. But I usually get them from Upwork. And this is what I ask for Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. Part-time, full-time, weekends are available. 
Must be a proactive team player. Experience is a must. Immediate hiring, interviewing today. Must speak great fluent American English. Must be able to use the Mojo dialer. And must have high internet speed, computer, and quiet background for working. Um, so pretty simple stuff, right? I prefer for them to be experienced. If they are not, I have to train them myself or have another virtual assistant train them. They're usually cheaper if they aren't trained. Um, like you're looking at maybe three to four dollars an hour compared to when they're experienced, they're looking at maybe five to six dollars an hour. Now keep in mind, these are virtual assistants from overseas. They're usually from the Philippines, from India, from Nicaragua. Um, that's the reason that they're priced so low. You know, we're not trying to you know scam anyone with with you know with any prices. This is the price that they're asking for. This is they're getting paid in their own currency and and they're living in their own hometown. Um, so. If you want to pay for American virtual assistants and pay the minimum wage, you can go right on ahead, but it does get expensive. I get so many comments on, you know, how I'm ripping someone off by paying them $5 an hour, but this is their minimum wage. This is how much they're asking for. And sometimes it's a little bit more than, than their minimum wage. I've had virtual assistants that came to me and said they'll work for $2 an hour. They were obviously inexperienced and they didn't know anything, but they needed to work. They'll work 80 hours a week if need be. And it's insane that, the, their work ethic is absolutely insane. Um, so it's up to you guys on what you want to use. They're obviously American uh, virtual assistants, but you're going to be paying the minimum wage. Like here in Jersey, I'm going to be paying $15, $16 an hour, which is insane because I can get four virtual assistants from the Philippines or Nicaragua. And, you know, they'll do the same amount of work. So it's really up to you guys on which one you prefer. I'm probably going to go with the $4 an hour. So this is what I asked for. I do ask for Mojo Dialer. It is what I'm comfortable using. So virtual assistants are amazing, but they need to be tracked. Um, you know, they do slag off sometimes. They do get lazy, just like anyone else. Uh, so you have to keep track of them, tr keep track of their progress, keep track of their work. And one of the ways I do that is with Mojo Dialer. Now, there are other softwares like Call Tools, like Batch Dialer, um, but I use Mojo Dialer first and I just kind of got used to it. So I haven't really shopped around for other tools. Now with Mojo Dialer, rather than calling one line and you know waiting for it to ring and answering and going on to the next one, it calls three people at once for you, which is pretty cool. It also has a recording feature so I can listen in on the calls. It also tracks how many calls they're making, how many calls were paused, how many calls were hung up. So it's pretty, everything is kind of in front of you. Now, one of the biggest advantages when, when recording a call is listening in with the virtual assistant. Now I know what they're making mistakes with. Now I know what they need help with. Now I know to get on a Zoom call and tell them how to answer this question differently. So truly, virtual assistants don't work unless you do. If you don't know the answer to the question, if you don't know how to talk to homeowners, how are you going to teach a virtual assistant to do so, right? Yes, some of them come experienced, some of them come trained, but there are going to be certain scenarios, certain situations where they won't know the answer and they might ruin a deal because of that. They are not you. And they, you know, they're as, as fluent in English as they are, some terms they don't understand, sarcasm they don't understand, right? So keep in mind, you have to keep track of all this. You have to retrain your virtual assistants. We get Zoom calls with them almost every week, every two weeks in order to, to make it as best as possible when it comes to communicating with the homeowners. Like I'll listen in, see all their mistakes and, and have them, you know, fix it. That's the biggest thing. Fix your mistakes and not make the same mistakes over and over again. That way we're continuously closing more deals. All right. And the next one we have is this position, right? This position, we've done the first part of wholesaling real estate, which is acquisitions, getting a property, locking it under contract. The next part is this position. Now, one thing that I didn't really talk about in the slide is contracts, right? I do have a video explaining exactly about the contracts over here. Check it out. I go sentence by sentence on the contracts that i have literally explaining what every sentence means one of the biggest mistakes that you can make is sending a contract to a homeowner and not being able to answer their question it's your contract how do you not know what it means so i made a video it explains it step by step on what everything means so check that video out in in terms of of what you want to know about the contracts but for the acquisition part, we're locking up a purchase and sales agreement, right? With the homeowner, they're signing a purchase and sales agreement. Now with this position, we're going to be finding a cash buyer and making them sign an assignment agreement. So let's talk about cash buyers, where to find them. The biggest one, your best friend is going to be Facebook investor groups, right? Facebook investor groups, Facebook marketplace, Craigslist, LinkedIn, real estate auctions. Every county has an auction. 
search up the auction app online figure out where your county auction is and just show up you don't have to uh you don't have to pay to be there um you have to pay to actually bid but you don't have to pay to be there just stand in the sign lines figure out who's bidding figure out who's registering figure out who has money right then a lot of the times in auctions you have to have at least 20 percent down i know here in jersey it's 20 percent down so go a little little earlier than than when registration starts figure out who's actually registering who has 20 percent down cash right then and there and so those are going to be your buyers a quick conversation hey i have this property you might be interested in and show it to them another one is real estate agents they're going to be your best friend they know cash buyers you know if you're willing to part with a little bit more of your assignment fee to give it to them go right on ahead another one is networking events they're always happening go to your local networking event hard money lenders bigger pockets connected investor prop stream and batch leads trust me there's so many tools now prop stream and batch leads are kind of like my last resort um same as finding leads for homeowner you can find leads for cash buyers um pull a list skip trace it and call them up or text them um, but this is kind of last resort. If you have a really good deal, finding a cash buyer is truly the easiest part of this entire thing, right? So the first step is always going to be finding a good deal. Um, but this is what we have for finding cash buyers. Again, there's also other ways, uh, but these are the best. These are going to be your best friend. And one other one is JVs, right? Partnerships, you probably heard them a lot. Um, we offer a JV program as well. If you have a property that you're looking to find a buyer, we'll help you lock it up. I have a link in the description as well for that. Um, you know, someone, either me or someone on my team is gonna reach out to you, get a little bit more information. Uh, we also help you lock it up on their contract. But here's the thing, I need to know those four things. Remember how to pre-qualify a homeowner. I need to know the general condition. I need to know their motivation. I need to know their timeline and their price. I need these four things to help you lock it up on their contract. So really, you just need to find a deal. Everything else is going to be really, really simple. Um, really, finding a deal is the hardest part. And once you have that, once you learn to be able to do that, it's smooth sailing from there. Yeah. But I think this is all I got for you guys today. Um, I hope this explained just about everything that you guys need. Um, I tried to be as thorough as possible. We, we talked about almost everything that you would need in order to close a real estate wholesale transaction. Um, it really is a matter of just finding those homeowners that are motivated to sell and taking those low offers. And it's a numbers game. It truly is. The more people you re reach out to, the more people you get in contact with, the better chances of finding that yes and locking it up under contract. And then finding a cash buyer truly is the easiest part of all this because there's investors everywhere. This is what they do for a living. They need properties. They need us, right? They're not here making a thousand calls every single day. They're flipping a house instead. They need you to make those calls and find that property for them. And they don't care paying you 10, 20, $30,000 when they know they'll make 50, 60, 70. Um, so that's wholesaling for you. I hope you guys learned something and I hope you guys have tremendous luck with this. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget I have a Facebook group also linked in the description. If you guys have any questions, post it there. Um, you know, I used to have people message me on Instagram, but it just got really overwhelming. There were so many questions and a lot of them were so repetitive. So I figured I might as well just make a group and have you guys post the questions there. If I don't answer it, there are thousands of other people that are willing to answer it. I do double check in order that they're giving you the right information, but it's amazing. It's like this whole community of people answering each other and helping each other out. And that way, when you post a question, someone else might have had that same question. So it's two birds, one stone. But that's all, folks. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video.